Hey, long time no see. And you are. I don't know. Some of you guys have a name tag. I need one to remember. Well, I was away uh, last, I think I was sick a couple, was that two weeks ago? Yeah. And then I was at a conference this last week called Speak. And uh, it was all about the art of preaching, teaching the Bible. So we'll see if I learned anything tonight. (laughs) But it's good to be back. Let's pray. Lord, you have, you've given us a message, Lord, and not just pastors and teachers, but all of us. You've given us and entrusted us with the gospel, and it's to be heralded and trumpeted, Lord, to the world, to our neighbors, to our families, to our children. And so we pray, Lord, that, um, that your word tonight would just kind of uh, saturate us and, and illuminate our thinking. And so speak deeply to us, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, last time we were together, uh, if, if memory serves me correctly, uh, we began in chapter 5 comparing the two um, sort of representative humans, the two men, Adam and Jesus, and Adam uh, represents humanity. Jesus also represents humanity. We looked at the original sin of Adam and its implications, and, and we established that Adam was a real historical person, not a myth. Um, you know, there's a lot of that kind of discussion going on these days, uh, but Jesus took uh, took it to mean that Adam is real and historical. Um, and so we follow our Lord's lead. And then we establish that Adam is actually the father of all of us, that all humans came from Adam. Um, every nation, every tribe, every person, God, God only created one person from the dust, Adam. Every other person then came from Adam, including Eve, right? Eve was taken from the substance of Adam's body. So the consequences of Adam's sin uh, was passed on to all of us, to all humans after that. And, And Paul argued that the proof of the consequences of Adam's sin being passed on to us is that all people die. That's like there you go. There's the definitive proof. So this, this chapter and this text tonight, it's a global text. It's universal. And don't miss that. This is the defining reality of humanity. Um, and for every single person you will ever meet. So, and, and I love, you know, encountering and being confronted by these kind of texts. Like, okay, this, this helps me to understand the predicament that we're in and helps me to see people properly through the lens of the scripture. And so wimpy, wimpy worldviews produce wimpy Christians. And so we've got to allow the Bible to shape us and the way we think. This is not a wimpy worldview, and it's the true worldview. And it stretches over all history and over all the planet. It profoundly affects every single human in the world right now. It it impacts every headline in the news or on the internet. It's this truth. So, let's work our way through the rest of the chapter and uh, time permitting, I want to explore, we'll, we'll kind of go relatively quickly through the next few verses, but I, I want to land on the last verse and explore uh, or develop a, a truth with you tonight to close with that I think is important. So, uh, verse 15, the certainty of grace, look at verse 15, but the free gift is not like the trespass. For if many died through the one man's trespass, 
much more have the grace of God and the free gift by grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. Verse 16, and the free gift is not like the result of that one man's sin, for the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation, but the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. For if because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. So, so I love this. Paul is contrasting the difference between what Adam brought through his fall and what Jesus brings through his life, death, and resurrection. And Paul says what we get in Jesus is so much more, much more. So what does that mean? It, 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 simply put, it means that Adam's fall and the subsequent death and our subsequent sins are no match for the grace of God. Not even close. It is staggering to think about how completely death has reigned on this earth under Adam. Everyone dies. Everyone dies. The earth is in large part a giant graveyard. Billions upon billions of people have gone back to dust in the earth. No one survives. When a baby is born, it isn't a question of whether the baby will live or die. It's a question of when they will die. So we tend to think of this world as being the land of the living, but it, it's not. This is the land of the dying. And for those who trust Christ, we're on our way to the land of the living. So Paul says that the reign of life through, life, or through Jesus is much more certain than what death is even for us. And death is pretty certain, right? So, so apparently there, there is something more certain than death and taxes. And that's our reign in life through Christ. Okay, let's look at verse 18, that kind of Paul summarizing the two representative men. Verse 18, therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. For as the one man's disobedience, uh, the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. So there you have the very clear contrast. Through the one man's sin or trespass, condemnation came to everybody. Death is the proof of that, and so on. But then by the one man's act of righteousness, leading us to justification. We plowed on that word a little bit, but it means it's, it's as if we had never sinned. We are sinless in the eyes of God, in the sense of our position in him. And that's our destiny, obviously, right? When we breathe our last on this earth and breathe in the first breath of heaven, we are officially sinless at that point because we've been delivered from this body. And so that is our future, and it is certain. And so God has justified us so that when, when we are brought into the presence of the Lord and ushered into his glory and glorified ourselves in his presence, then there will be no oh, yuck, I still have some of this in me or on me. <laughs> it's gone. And we will 
emerge into what God has designed us to be all along. So we're in this, this short journey in the land of the dying where we walk by faith and not by sight, but one day our faith will give way to sight. We will see him as he is. Therefore, we will be like him. We're gonna be transformed into the image of Jesus in that day. Listen to what Isaiah the prophet prophesied about Jesus in Isaiah 53.10. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him, meaning Jesus, to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days, for the will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death. He was numbered with the transgressors, yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. There's one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus. And that's what Isaiah is prophesying. It pleased God to crush him. With a view towards our redemption, God placed on him the iniquity of us all. Jesus, laboring for our salvation, paying for our sins, and bringing deliverance, being numbered among the transgressors, being made in the likeness of sin, and yet being sinless. Jesus paid the price for us. And so we are justified. If you believe, and by believe, I mean biblical kind of belief, you are justified in the sight of God right now. No matter what kind of a week you've had, you're justified in his sight. So, Verse 20, notice the reason for the law. We're reminded again here, verse 20. Now the law came in to increase the trespass. <laughs> That's counterintuitive. Wait, I thought laws keep us from the trespass. But there Paul says, no, the law came to increase it. But where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. So Paul is struck this note on his guitar uh, back in chapter 3. You remember this, Romans 3, 19? Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped <laughs> and the whole world may be held accountable to God. Like... The law is given to shut us up in regards to us crowing about our own righteousness and our, you know, self-righteousness and so on. For by the works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight. For through the law comes knowledge of sin. There it is again. Through the law comes knowledge of sin. The law was not given to make us righteous. I use this illustration all the time, but I like it. Therefore, I will. So, relying on religion to save you or relying upon, we would say, the keeping of the moral code to save you, that's like being in an airplane that's going down, you get ready to jump out, you've got a parachute, you've got a bag of cement, you grab the bag of cement and jump out of the airplane. That's what it's like, the person grabbing onto the law to save them, trusting in religion to justify them. It doesn't work. It takes you down. You're grabbing onto the very thing that says you are a sinner in need of a savior. It's a huge truth. The law is a teacher, 
a schoolmaster, it says in Galatians. It teaches us about our true condition and then leads us to the solution to our condition. And the solution, of course, is Jesus. So sin, as powerful and pervasive as it is, is no match for the grace of our Lord Jesus, not even close. Where sin abounds, grace abounds much more. I mean, sin cannot outstrip grace, cannot get past it or outside of it. All right. So let's, let's look at this last verse, and I want you to allow me a few minutes before we bring the team back up to lead us in, into worship. And so I want to talk about the, the duration of life. Been thinking a lot about this lately. And so verse 21, kind of Paul wrapping up his thoughts, so that as death or sin reigned in death, grace might also uh, reign through righteousness leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So grace reigns through righteousness, leading to eternal life. And all of this is through Jesus, through Jesus. And that's been the theme of chapter five, right? Through Christ, through Christ. So eternal life. Have you thought deeply about eternal life? Eternal life means endless life life without any end at all, never-ending life. So if you have an infinite number and you subtract any finite number from the infinite number, what is the answer? Or, or let me put it more specifically. If you take infinity minus 10,000, what is the answer to that equation? It's infinity, because by definition, infinity is a number that cannot be diminished. It cannot be, uh, you know, spent. Only finite numbers become smaller when you subtract something from them. So, the very meaning of infinite is that when you take away from it, there's no less than when you began. So it seems that, that that wonderful verse in Amazing Grace, when we've been there 10,000 years, how does that verse go? <laughs> we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first began. Like that's literally true. Like Newton, the writer of that, nailed it. Eternal, infinite, life. In this life, every day we live is one less that we have to live. In the life to come, every passing day or century or millennium will mean the amount of future left for us is the same. It's never diminished. Now, why is this important? It's important because Romans 5 began with an infinite reality, and it's ending with an infinite reality. And I got to thinking about this, and, and, and it helps me to understand some things uh, concerning the magnitude of God's way of salvation, this eternality, that, that it's just so awesome. So the, the infinite reality, reality at the end of the chapter we just read, that's eternal life. That's an infinite reality. Endless days. Infinite life. Life of infinite duration. But is this infinite life, because a lot of people think about this, and those who don't know the Lord think about this, is this infinite, endless life boring? Is it going to be dull? Is it kind of life as we know it? 
where we, we have some pretty, you know, some good mountaintops here and there, but we kind of live down here mostly in the valley. And we have some good times. We have plenty of bad times. Is it going to be like that? Where we're never really satisfied? To extend our lives forever the way they are now, that does not sound appealing to me. In fact, to extend our lives the way they are now forever, I don't think that's good news at all. What's the best we can do? What's your best day? I mean, what's the pinnacle of your existence on this earth? Did, did you happen to hit the lottery and you got to spend Christmas morning at Disneyland or whatever, you know, the happiest place on earth? Not. I mean, what is it? Is it fishing your favorite fishing hole on a calm day or being on the mountaintop, you know, trying to go shoot an elk? Or what, I mean, what's your best day? Is it golfing, you know, on a beautiful golf? Or maybe it's on the beach somewhere. The greatest pleasures on earth become tedious and the 10,000th repetition of whatever, golfing again? But notice what Paul said back at the beginning of the chapter. Verse 1 of chapter 5, Therefore, since we've been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace, this awesome grace, which sin is no match for. And we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. So instead of saying we rejoice in the hope of eternal life, he says we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. A lot of people have a hard time. You know, what in the world will people do for a quibillion years in heaven? It, see, it has to become boring. It has to be boring. And I've had this conversation with people who don't believe, you know, and, and they say, you know, I, I think I'd rather be in hell where, you know, Satan is in charge and we're having a rager keg party down there. And I mean, it's a little rough, but <laughs> of course, that's a stupid off on many levels thought. So f first of all, let, let's, let's just clarify a couple things. We, we won't. We won't live forever in heaven, not exactly. We live forever in the new Jerusalem, the city, but it comes down out of heaven and is either on the earth or in direct proximity to the earth. So earth, we're gonna be on earth. And do you remember, there was a time when heaven and earth were united. And when God created Adam and then created Eve out of the substance of Adam's body, the Bible says in Genesis 3 that God walked in the garden in the cool of the day. So there was no lending and, and a, you know, uh, a, a divergence of heaven and earth at that point. So that day's coming back on earth as it is in heaven. That's kind of the whole, the whole story of the Bible, is we're, we're in that ark right now, heading towards the day when heaven becomes one with earth. And, you know, as to the idea of Satan being the, the head guy in hell, no, he's the chief prisoner. And 
We don't read of any kegs in hell in the Bible. <laughs> no beer there. But it's crucial to see that we hope in the glory of God. Okay? So this takes, takes our eyes, and, and rather than thinking about the duration of life, we fix our eyes directly on the Lord and on his glory. And, and this is the reason that our future, it must be eternal. It has to be eternal. And it cannot possibly be boring. There will be, there will be no such thing as boredom. It will not exist. Any amount of time short of eternity would be inadequate for finite people to experience the glory of God. It will take forever to see all that there is to see of him and admire all that there is to admire of him and enjoy all that there is to enjoy of our God. What is the glory of our God? It's his substance, it's his reality. The glory of God is, is all that God is in his being and in his essence. I like to bring it down to understandable metaphors. Anybody like ice cream? Anybody got a favorite? Rocky Road, that's, that's probably in... Probably one of the top, right, rocky road. So, so suppose we go down to wherever your favorite ice cream, you know, Baskin or Cold Stone or one of those ones, and imagine it's a hot day. And you get your cone or your bowl of rocky road, and you take that for, I mean, isn't that first bite just like, it's amazing, right? You just, you savor it. And you just, you close your eyes and, mm, that is so good. That's the glory of God. That's the glory of God. Do you enjoy being in the outdoors, in the mountains, hiking, fishing? You get that sense of, of awe and transcendence. That's the glory of God. Do you like beauty and art and human beauty and all that? All of that's the glory of God. It's the glory of God. James 1.17, every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. So God is, is the one being who does not change. He's eternal, dwelling outside of time and space. He is a spirit, and he is the one from whom all things have been created. And so from him come created things which are not eternal, but they, his good gifts they give us the glimpse at his glory. God is the source of every good thing we enjoy in this life. He's the fountainhead of every pleasure and every joy. But in this life, on this side of glory, we only get four tastes of what's ahead. We get nibbles. So, anybody fans of going to Costco and just eating the samples. <laughs> you can kind of game the system, right? You work your way through the store, you don't even have to buy lunch, even though lunch is only a buck fifty, those hot dogs. So you nibble. Of course, we know the idea, right? They want you to take that nibble of whatever it is and like, oh man, that was so good, I'm gonna go buy the 10 pound thing of it or whatever. Kind of like a drug dealer <laughs> when you think about it. But in our current condition, we're living on a fallen planet. We are dying physically, but we get samples of God's glory. Fortes. But God is infinite, and so his glory is infinite. His goodness is infinite. It has no boundaries. 
no limits, no end. It's not small and exhaustible. It, it will not and it cannot run out. You can't spend it down. You, it's God-sized. It's infinite, therefore, it will take us an eternity to see it all and taste it all and admire it all and enjoy it all. So this will not be, our future will not be endless duration of a boring life. <laughs> Boredom will cease to exist. It will not be repetitions of old joys and pleasures either. It'll be ever new sights and wonders and experiences and pleasures forever and ever. At thy right hand, there's fullness of joy and pleasures forevermore, says the psalmist. Now, this hope, we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God, okay? That's where our hope is. We're not hoping in eternal life. We're hoping in the glory of God. Hope is the expectation of that. It's the expectation of this coming good. It's certainty. Hope in the Bible is certain. This is a certainty. So the coming good that we are certain about is the glory of our God and being with our God and experiencing his glory. And this hope, this expectation is vital as we live our life here because it will keep us from meandering in life. It'll keep us from going side to side and getting in the ditches of life, of which there's plenty of opportunity for that if we take our eyes off of the Lord, if we stop hoping, expecting that this is where we're headed, this is where we're going, this is coming. If I take my eyes off of that, man, my life can be impacted. The decisions I make, all of it can be impacted. And so hope keeps us pressing towards the mark of the upward call. When someone gets pregnant, we say she's expecting, or they're expecting, right? They're expecting. Sometimes when a couple is, you know, find out that the wife is pregnant, they'll, they'll hold off on sharing the news because there's a little bit of uncertainty that, you know, miscarriage can happen and we don't want to tell a lot of people and if, if somehow we don't get out of the early stages of the pregnancy, we, it'll be a little rougher on us, you know, to have to tell everybody and... You know, there's that kind of thing. And so there's, there is expectation, but it's not, it's not totally certain. So there's a little bit of, well, it, it could, I mean, God forbid, but it, it maybe wouldn't happen. But as the months progress, they start fixing up the bedroom to be a nursery and they start telling, letting people know, and pretty soon there's a shower, and you get the strollers and the diapers and so on. And so listen, expecting hope, biblical hope, it alters the way we live. It, it changes the way we conduct. We're preparing because we're expecting. God's people are expecting. The longer we live and walk with the Lord, the more certain we generally become. And so we're expecting, we're, we're rejoicing in hope of the glory of God. We're expecting that that day is coming. And so as we do expect now, we're preparing for that day. We rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, endurance produces character, character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame. You're not gonna be, you're not gonna be, oh shoot, I, I shouldn't have lived so expectantly. I shouldn't have been so, 
you know, putting my hope in, in this thing. We will not be disappointed or ashamed that we prepared for our future with the Lord by pursuing Christ's likeness or in, you know, preaching the gospel to our neighbors, loving our spouse as well, dis uh, discipling our children, doing a great job at our place of employment, and living a sanctified life unto the Lord. We won't be disappointed. Our hope in Jesus is not misplaced, not at all. There will be no miscarriage. We have God's promise. It's more sure than our impending physical death. <laughs> That's Paul's point. So, Titus 2.11 says, the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. And it teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope. The certain blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So, so we're, we're expecting, and God's grace, because we've received it, is teaching us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions. And so we're, we're preparing our lives. We're living our lives in light of the coming glory of God. We're rejoicing. We're going to suffer some, but suffer's, suffering's producing for us. It's helping us. Suffering produces endurance. Remember, it's, it, it toughens us up. We can take, after we've gone through a trial, we're all of a sudden, we can take more, man. Now we're strong. Like steel being tempered in the fire is stronger and more durable. So we go through the fire. We're stronger now. And that endurance produces character, that sense of, you know what? I'm a, I am a real, I am a son of God. You're a daughter of God. And I, sometimes I doubt it. Sometimes my flesh is just so overwhelming to me that I, I, don't, I don't feel real. I feel like a poser. But I go through the trial and I endure. And I gain some endurance and that endurance is now producing character in me. I feel more authentic. I know I'm a child of God, but man, sometimes. And when that sense of authenticity is being pr produced in greater measure, that produces hope. More certain expectation. Certainty is not valued in our current cultural condition. It's thought of to be a sin, that anyone could be certain or dogmatic. That's not the Bible, folks. The Lord's wanting us to become more and more expectant of the coming reality of his glory in our being in his presence. All right, that's all I got. Let's pray. Lord, we want the, the pole of earth, the stuff, the experiences, the material things, the, all that stuff to, to lose its, its force upon us. And that more and more we would be living as expectant people For it does not yet appear what we shall be. Yet, we know we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him 
purifies their life. So Lord, may, may our hope become more pure, more intense, more real. And as it does, that it would begin to impact our lives. That we would want to view others as higher than ourselves. That we would want to serve knowing that the greatest in the kingdom is the servant of all. Lord, that we would take up our cross and deny ourselves and follow you wherever you might lead. in worship, Lord.